reading from Adrian Marie Brown at the top of the sermon this morning. For those of us who may be coming here with a bit of skepticism about emerging joy, <coughs> thoughts that can run through one's head, and I know these have run through mine, life can't always be joyful. Sometimes you just gotta slog through. How can we embrace joy when there's so much going wrong in the world? To get to the freedom and liberation we seek, it can't all be about joy, can it? It reminds me of this age-old Aesop's fable about the ant and the grasshopper. Are there folks here who are familiar with the story? Anybody heard it? Yes. The grasshopper delightfully plays around and hops and skips in the grass with their fiddle while the ant works hard all summer to store away the food for the winter. As the ant trudges with food on their back, they warn the grasshopper that they need to get to collecting some food or winter is going to be a tough one for the grasshopper and they will be starving. Come winter time, sure enough, the grasshopper is knocking on the ant's door, and the ant is surprisingly super annoyed about it. <laughs> they did a bunch of work to collect food all winter, and who is this grasshopper to approach the ant about food now? It is from the perspective of the ant, the busy worker bee, the sense of dedication and hard work that I see them as like the location of skepticism about joy. The grasshopper has embraced joyful living in excess, and the ant is left to do all the work and then share from the spoils of their labor. But here comes Adrienne Marie Brown to challenge those of us who think like the ant. In her book released this year, Pleasure Activism, she is inviting all of us to orient our lives towards pleasure, towards what feels good. This is an invitation that includes listening to where we find joy and energy in life. It is an invitation to release some of what has been draining us, or even to rearrange the work or the tasks we do to make them more pleasurable. And she brings in this important point about excess. It's not that we need to be more like the grasshopper, only embracing joyful activity all of the time, and it's not that we need to live lives like the ant, trudging through life, dedicated to work and solely work, with little source of joy or really much rest. We are invited to find balance in enough. Not just seeking an excess of joy all the time to self-soothe, out of a sense that we are constantly lacking joy in our lives, but rather to create a baseline of joy in acknowledging to ourselves how much joy is enough joy, seeking it in each day along the way, finding places where we experience joy already and spending more time or energy there. It is how we are hardwired after all to seek pleasure and joy in this life if we really want to live it to its fullest extent. A life devoid of joy is a hard life to live. I am not telling you anything new here this morning. And yet, how do we find it? And when we find joy, how do we keep in touch with it? Some of it has to do with the gratitude for the life we have. If you came to the interfaith Thanksgiving service last year, I shared a written piece there that I'm going to share this morning. Who was here last year for the interfaith Thanksgiving service? Or who was there at the interfaith Thanksgiving service? Okay. Well, if you weren't there, perhaps this will be a bit of an enticement to attend this beautiful and important service this year here. So this was the reading that we used. Mark Nepo, poet and author, writes, I was just writing the other day about being grateful, thanking God that my experiences have hollowed me out like a hollow bone. But I was never thankful while I was being hollowed out. And I think that is very human. When I have experienced 
experience difficult things with family or friends or in life situations, it's very hard. I certainly wasn't thankful to the pain in my stomach when I was recently ill. I didn't want it to be there. But trying to hold the larger view at the same time is where gratitude lives. So let me give you an image. If you're at sea and you're in a raft and the swells of the sea are huge, when you are lifted to the top of the wave, you can see eternity. When you come down into the belly of the wave, you can't see anything but a wave and lots of water. The kind of gratitude we're talking about is not to deny the fact that you're in the belly of a wave and that wave might crash on you, but to never lose sight of the horizon, even though in this moment you're not seeing it. I love this metaphor of the wave because it acknowledges we will not always be at our most joyful. We will not always be able to find gratitude especially in moments when we are suffering. Nepo suggests here that the joy found in life comes from the moments when we can look back on our experiences, our days, and be grateful for the things we experienced. Our joy is easier to access when we can keep our eyes to the horizon, to the bigger picture. To cultivate joy takes time for reflection. It takes intentional time for reflection rather than moving from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. I also want to say that I think the pursuit of joy comes in paying particular attention to where it is showing up in our lives. Where is joy showing up in our lives? Like our meditation this morning, taking time to check in about what is bringing us joy, what is draining us, where things feel ordinary rather than to either extreme. And it can take difficult life circumstances to get there. Following a cancer diagnosis and the treatments that followed, uh, my ministry colleague was in remission and some time had passed, and she shared with me that this experience she had had really had her paying attention to where joy was showing up in her life. She said something like, um, life can be too short to spend doing things that lack joy. If there's no joy in it, I don't want to be doing it. Having this tough life experience of living with cancer with the possibility of her own death, with the reality of the fragility of her life, she came out the other side of this experience with a deep commitment to joy and a recognition that that was what she needed to pursue. And that commitment to cultivation. She was telling me this as we were serving on a volunteer committee together that was in deep conflict. And I have to tell you, we really had to dig to find the joy there. But it was so worth it. It was so worth it. So it's not just about paying attention to where joy shows up. It's also about leaning into the things that bring us joy. Whether it is a life activity, like swimming, or singing, or reading, or spending time with friends, or if it's something that we even just get into for a season in our lives, a spiritual practice, a hobby, taking part in a larger movement, filling a volunteer or service position. It's not about engaging these things in excess to the exclusion of the things we need to do to support our lives and our families, but it is about carving out regular time to engage with the practices and the activities that bring us joy. We spend so much of our days doing the things we have to do. Why not begin to shift our lives towards what brings us pleasure and joy? Why not pay attention to the things that fill us up and spend more time doing those things? And here is where it gets tricky because there are times when the, the practices that bring us joy become a task. Or just another thing to get done on the to-do list. So it's, if it's becoming a chore, pay attention. For a time in seminary, the ministers and rabbis and imams and religious leaders who were teaching us told us, you have to have a regular spiritual practice to sustain yourselves as ministers. Wise advice. And thus began my journey to find the right practice that would be emblematic of the best ministry. 
I try my many things out of a sense that this is something I should be doing rather than paying attention to what brings me joy and feeds my spirit. I prayed the most earnest prayers. I meditated for a full 20 minutes, even though it drove me nuts. <laughs> I lit candles, I lit incense, I sang alone and with people, but all of this was coming from this sense that this was yet another box to check off on the to-do list, the large to-do list of life. That there was a right way to take care of yourself, and by golly, I was going to find it. I believe that this is referred to as wrestling the joy out of life. <laughs> it was not an intuitive process, and quite frankly, so much of it was about people pleasing and keeping at the center what others thought about me and what I thought I should be doing. Adrian Marie Brown instead asks us to pay attention to where the joy and the energy is organically coming up in our lives. To allow that to emerge, rather than attempting to create it out of a sense of what we should be doing. And it emerges through experimentation, remaining open to what comes up as we pay attention to our lives in different ways. Likewise, we are also invited to pay attention to where our energy is being drained. What are the things that just suck the joy right out of life? And is there a way to be doing them differently or even not at all? To let them go. And of course there will be things that we will need to do out of a sense of responsibility to ourselves and our community. However, one of the points she lifts up consistently throughout her book is that we are doing no one any favors when we show up to trudge through something, when we are doing something from a standpoint of having to do it, or a place of exhaustion, boredom, crankiness, or even burnout. When we're showing up that way, those around us know. It can be written on our faces. Folks know because it lives in our attitudes, in our interactions with those around us, and especially with the folks we live with. When we are the ant, it shows. And so what are the things in life that bring you joy? What brings you great pleasure? When you pause to consider that question, what comes to mind? And I want to hear from you, because I feel like we're going to fill up this space a little bit more than just me talking. Dancing. Dancing. Singing. Singing. Crafting. Meditating. A walk in the woods. A walk in the woods. <clears throat> Teaching. Crafting. Chocolate. <laughs> there you go. Ice cream. Baking. Ice cream. <laughs> Making stuff. Making stuff. Crocheting. Writing. Running. Playing with the granddaughter. Oh, playing with the granddaughter. Community. Community. Reading a lot. Reading a lot. Trump. Oh, you know I can't say that from under your belt. <laughs> Certain politicians need to be able to say that. <laughs> giggling? Is that what you just said? I said eating. Eating, eating. And then giggling. Family dinners. Girls weekend. Girls weekend.
Can you imagine being healed enough? Happy enough? Connected enough? Having enough space in your life to actually live it? Can you imagine being free enough? And do you understand that you, as you are, 